Hello and welcome back to the Come Follow Me Bible Challenge. My name is Jeremy Howard. I'm the staff pastor here at Orchard Hills Bible Church in Payson, Utah. And today we are talking about the book of Ezekiel, but mostly the New Covenant in the book of Ezekiel. This is the New Covenant Part 2. Part 1 was last week looking at the book of Jeremiah. Next week, getting into the first week of November, can you believe it? We'll be talking about the book of Daniel. Wow. Wow, wow. Uh, And then we'll be entering the section known as the Minor Prophets to take us through the end of the year. Okay. Very well. Um, Ezekiel. A little bit of background about Ezekiel. Quite similar to Jeremiah, if you heard last week's lesson and the uh, background information about Jeremiah. Ezekiel was a prophet speaking to Judah during the Babylonian captivity. And so um, Jeremiah was was kind of sent to warn people about the coming captivity and exile, and Ezekiel's kind of speaking to them uh, in the middle of everything, kind of hitting the fan. Like Jeremiah, Ezekiel desired that they would hear his prophecy and repent, of course. They both desired the repentance of their people who were, by and large, very wicked, rebellious. Uh, But he was also used to deliver details about their future national hope, like Jeremiah. And as with our study in Jeremiah, that's what we're going to focus on in Ezekiel, the future national hope that was talked about in his prophecy. And we're going to start by looking at Ezekiel chapter 36 and read a, a pretty large portion here about what God says he's going to do in Israel. So Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 22. It says, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring a famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places to be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being a desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say, This desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. The waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left round about you will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. Thus says the Lord God, This also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed feasts. So will the waste cities be filled with flocks of men, then they will know that I am the Lord. Okay, well, if you were a part of the uh, lesson last time, in meaning that you listened, <laughs> I suppose, you know that a lot of what Ezekiel just said is similar to what we hear from Jeremiah about there's going to be a, a salvation, a restoration, God is going to act, God is going to put them back in their land, God's going to do a great work among 
Israelites. Remember, this is written to Israelites, not written to anyone else. And if we look at um, some specifics, we can see some pretty interesting details. So in um, verse 25, just like with Jeremiah, we see that there is going to be some judgment here. He says that Israel has filthiness because of their idols, and they will have to be purged of their idols and of their filthiness. That's going to have to happen. Down in verse 32, he calls them presently to be ashamed and to be confounded for their ways. They are to consider how they have rebelled against the Lord and how they're deserving of judgment. But think of and consider all the amazing blessings that are that's going to happen. God says he's going to sprinkle clean water on them. He's going to sprinkle clean water. Now, what is that? That is... That's a cleansing activity of God that he, he causes someone who is filthy to become clean. It's in the same sentence as their filthiness. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. This is an act of God, not an act of man. He's not saying, go find clean water and clean yourself. But God is coming to them, and he's doing the sprinkling to make them clean. I will cleanse you, God says from all your filthiness and your idols. This is what I believe Jesus was referring to when he said that you must be uh, born of water and uh, born from above. Okay, you must be born again. You have to be born from above. And you know what? While we're here, maybe I should just pull that up because that's an important passage, being born again. Um, And that's simple enough to do. John chapter 3 is where that is found. And uh, Jesus says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, there's been a lot of controversy as to what that water is. What does it mean to be born of water? There are different ways you can take that. Some people have said natural birth is being born of water. Some say baptism. But it seems to me that uh, Jesus was probably thinking of this uh, passage, where you have to be born of water, you have to be made clean by God himself. And that's going to happen to all of Israel one day, Jeremiah says. But beyond that, beyond the clean water, they're also going to have a new heart. That's a sweet blessing, isn't it? To have a new heart and a new spirit. Now, this isn't talking about an actual physical heart, but uh, they're going to be new creations. They're going to become uh, new creations with new motivations to have uh, a holy mind and to be focused on God. Instead of having a heart of stone that's callous toward the things of God, they're going to be sensitive toward the things of God. Beyond that, verse 27, God says that he will put his spirit within Israel— The Holy Spirit is going to dwell within these Israelites, and that will cause them to walk in God's statutes. So not only will they be new creations that are sensitive toward the things of God, but they will have God himself leading them to walk in his ways. They will be careful to observe his ordinances. So again, like with Jeremiah, we see that they're being conformed to holiness in the way that they live their lives. Well, um, it's not just a spiritual salvation. God goes on in the very next verse, verse 28, to say, You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. Not just any old land. They're going to live in a specific land that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their descendants. They're going to live in their own land. Cities and waste places are going to be rebuilt. That's verses 33 to 36 here, that... Instead of desolation, there's going to be cultivation. Instead of uh, being waste and barren, these cities are going to be inhabited. Instead of uh, being weak and broken down, the cities are going to be fortified. There's going to be a physical restoration happening in Israel. And I love this phrase, the desolate place is going to become like the Garden of Eden. What What an amazing comparison that is. It's going to be so fruitful, so so fortified, 
and beautiful that it'll be like the Garden of Eden. That physical restoration is going to take place in that specific land. Well, that's amazing, isn't it? Well, in chapter 37, Ezekiel gets a vision of this where it's the the dry bones. Um, God asks him, hey, can these bones live? (laughs) And of course, no, but you know, Ezekiel doesn't want to say no, so it's like, oh, God, you know. Well, he says, speak over the bones to hear the word of the Lord. And then he sees this amazing thing. The bones come together, bone to its bone. Sinews were put on them, flesh grew, skin covered them, but there was no breath. And God says to prophesy to the breath and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come the four winds, O breath, breathe on the these slain that they may come to life. So I prophesied, Ezekiel said, as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet in exceedingly great army. Well, that's just a picture of what's going to happen when God puts his spirit within Israel, and they will come to life, and he's going to place them in their own land. So he gets this really vivid vision that... It brings to life the prophecy. Well, um, I want to finish by talking about the second half of Ezekiel 37. Particularly, um, I want to spend some time talking about these two sticks, because if you're LDS or if you were raised LDS, then surely you've heard about the two sticks that Ezekiel had. Well, um, here we go. Let's, let's talk about this. Ezekiel 37, 15, right after he has this amazing vision with the dry bones. It says, The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, And you, son of man, take for yourself one stick and write on it for Judah and for the sons of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and all the house of Israel, his companions. Then join them for yourself one to another into one stick, that they may become one in your hand. And when the sons of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not declare to us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the, the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will put them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they will become one in my hand. The sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king for all of them, and they will no longer be two nations and no longer be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols or with their detestable things or with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them, and they will be my people, and I will be their God. Okay, so... In this uh, demonstration that God calls Ezekiel to participate in, you got two sticks. One represents the northern kingdom, Israel, Ephraim, Joseph. The other represents the southern kingdom, Judah. And these two kingdoms, in God's future redemptive program, they will be brought together as one, They will be one nation, no longer two. They will have one king ruling over them. They will be in their land together. That's this big picture future restoration of Israel. What has been taught in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that these two sticks represent the Book of Mormon and the Bible. In fact, uh, the current president of the Mormon Church, Russell M. Nelson, back in 2007, he said this, Isaiah was not the only Old Testament prophet who foretold the Book of Mormon. And that's in reference, I believe, to Isaiah 29, which I did a video on not that long ago. He says, Ezekiel wrote, Take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel. Then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel. 
and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. This is the commentary he gives on that. Today, saints living in many nations of the earth gratefully hold the Bible, the stick of Judah, and the Book of Mormon, the stick of Ephraim, bound as one in their hands. Now that's an interesting interpretation. Let's check out this passage again. The stick of Ephraim, verse 16, and all the house of Israel, his companions, that's the northern kingdom. Okay. The other one is the stick that's for Judah, the sons of Israel and his companions. And the whole point, God says down in verse 20, by putting these two sticks together, it shows that God will take the sons of Israel from among the nations. He's going to gather them from every side and to bring them into their own land. He's going to make them one nation in the land, verse 22, and give them one king. No longer they be two nations. They be, uh, no longer they be two kingdoms. One nation, one kingdom, one king. That has nothing to do with the Book of Mormon. Uh, that To get that interpretation out of Ezekiel 37, you have to totally, completely ignore the message of Ezekiel and what Ezekiel was trying to communicate. When you're interpreting the Bible, the goal should always be to, in, to understand the text as the author desired his audience to understand the text. And here, there is just nothing about the Book of Mormon at all. And we could go through the Bible and give all sorts of secret hidden meanings to all, all sorts of things. I mean, I could, I could claim to be a prophet and make up things and say that that's what those texts really mean. But that seems like it's um, not a very fair treatment of the text. It's not fair to the original authors who had a desired meaning. And nowhere does God ever instruct me to read the Bible that way. Uh, in fact, he wants me to hear and understand his clear communication to me. So um, there's really no warrant for that. Uh, this text has nothing to do with the Book of Mormon. So wanted to make that clear. But we should finish reading Ezekiel 37 because there's some really neat stuff here, particularly about the Davidic kingdom. The last five verses of the chapter say, My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I gave to Jacob my servant, in which your fathers lived, and they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David my servant will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Amazing passage. Man, can you believe that was only five verses? Well, God says David will be king when these two kingdoms are brought together and they are one people. Uh, dwelling in the land with one king. David will be the king. And there's some debate as to whether this is actually David, the resurrected David, or if this is Jesus. But they will have one king. David will be king over them, it says. And there will be a new covenant, a uh, new covenant of peace. It's an everlasting covenant, God says. And it's a covenant of, of peace that he makes with Israel. And we talked about that's the significance of the phrase, the new covenant, last week. But uh, something else that's interesting when it comes to God making a covenant with them, this is Isaiah 49, verses 7 and 8. God says, To the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers, kings will see and arise, Princes will also bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. 
And if you're watching my screen, you can see that we've got capital letters here for uh, the one being spoken to, to the despised one, capital O, to the one abhorred by the nation, capital O. So the interpretation here made by the translators, and it's a correct one, is that you have the Lord speaking to the Lord, the Father speaking to the Son, the one who is the servant of rulers, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Princes will bow down before him. Kings will see him and arise before him. He's been chosen to serve and to be lifted up. And in verse 8 it says, In a favorable time I have answered you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you, and I will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people to restore the land to make them inherit desolate heritages. So how is this all going to happen in Israel? Well, um, Jesus Christ is, of course, the catalyst for all of this. And we talked about, again, we talked about this last week. It's through Jesus Christ that the covenant promises are going to be realized and fulfilled. It will not be apart from Jesus Christ. It's going to be through Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself is given as a covenant. The Son of God is given as a covenant for the people. And through his work and his ruling as king, the land will be restored. He's going to serve as the ultimate king. He's going to be the ultimate Israelite. He's going to serve as the ultimate steward of the earth. He's going to fulfill all of these roles that man has never been able able to f- live out perfectly. He's going to live them out perfectly, and all things will be restored through him, the one who is a covenant for the people. He's been given for a covenant for the people. And back in Ezekiel, God says that he's going to place them in the land, he's going to multiply them, and set his sanctuary in their midst forever. His dwelling place is going to be with them. They will be his, his people, and he will. they will testify that he is their God. And the nations will know that he is the Lord who sanctifies Israel. There will be no doubt that he is the one doing this. Well, Jesus is the king of kings who will rule over all the people, and his dominion will be from sea to sea as he comes again a second time to fulfill these covenant promises to lead Israel into restoration as he's given as a covenant for the people. Now, we talked about last week how there's an already not yet happening with this because the new covenant has been inaugurated with the church. Jesus is currently building his church before he turns back his focus to the people Israel. And if you were to look at Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8 goes into great detail in applying the new covenant language to the church. Though it's not been fulfilled, there's this inauguration that has begun. It says in Colossians chapter 1 that those who believe in Jesus Christ today have been transferred into his kingdom. His kingdom is not yet what it will be, but it has begun to a degree. And we see the the blessings that were promised in Ezekiel 36 and 37, that they've, they've started with the church. We've been sprinkled with clean water if we've believed in Christ and we've been born again. John 3, Jesus talking about you have to be born of water and the Spirit. Well, if you're born again... God's Spirit has entered into your heart, and He's washed you clean with water. That's, that's also a, a phrase found in Titus chapter 3. And that happens to people today. It won't just happen with Israel in the future. It can happen with Gentiles today who believe in Jesus Christ. He gives a new heart and a new spirit. As He's going to do with Israel, He's doing it today by all who believe in Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, They become new creations. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You have a new heart, a new spirit. The Holy Spirit enters the life of the believer today. The Holy Spirit comes into a person's life, and a person's body becomes the temple of the Spirit, which is absolutely amazing. You see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. People are sanctified today. Now, even though they're not totally conformed, to God's holiness. They are being conformed to the image of Christ progressively throughout their lives. Even though 
One day, all of Israel will be perfectly conformed to holiness, and all people who are in Christ, not just Israel, but all nations who are in Christ, will be perfectly conformed. Even today, whether Jew or Gentile, if someone is in Christ, that person is being progressively conformed to the image of Jesus. So all of those things are happening now in the church, through the church. Yet there's coming a day when All of Abraham's descendants will be saved. That hasn't happened yet. That's the not yet aspect of this. They will be restored in their land as well. They will be taken back to that land promised to Abraham, and there will be great physical blessings that they will enjoy in that land among other nations. And there will be a new temple. In fact, the very book that we're looking at, Ezekiel, if you start reading in chapter 40 all the way through the end of the book, chapter 48, you see that there's a new temple that's built. It's going to be in the Messiah's kingdom. It's humongous. It's going to be uh, this, this very amazing testimony to God's faithfulness, doing all of this for His name, to vindicate His name. And uh, none of that has, has happened yet, but it's going to happen. What does that mean for you? How does that affect you? Well, um, today is the day of salvation. We don't look to the future and say, wow, that sounds awesome. So this time is just a waste and, and let's just uh, you know, keep looking forward to the future and, and not even worry about today. That's not true. Today is the day of salvation. You can start enjoying the new covenant blessings today. Perhaps you're living under a, a law right now, whether that's the law of Moses or man-made laws, whatever it is, and you're trying to, to live up to some standard yourself. That's not the new covenant. Perhaps you you don't sense that God is leading you in your life at all. You don't feel like a new creation. You don't feel like you've got the Holy Spirit renewing your mind, causing you to grow in holiness. Well, that's not the new covenant. You're not enjoying the new covenant blessings. I want you to be able to enjoy what God has offered us in this inaugurated new time. This is a new administration where God has inaugurated this new covenant, and you can enter into this life by believing in Jesus Christ today, understanding that the Word who was with God and who was God, John 1.1, He became flesh, He dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, lived the life that we couldn't live, died the death that we deserve, so that if we put our trust in Him, we will be saved. We will be born again. We will be given a new spirit, a new heart. We'll be given the Holy Spirit that we can walk in His ways and grow and learn in Him. We'll be put in a family, the new covenant community, God's church, and we'll grow in holiness and in knowledge of God. I want that for you, and and you can have that today if you believe in Christ. Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, I love talking about the New Covenant and the big storyline of the Bible. I look forward to future conversations. Next week we'll be in the book of Daniel. Lots to see there. Hope you'll join me. God bless.